India cries out for water in the winter when all it brings is dry wind. When it comes in the summer, it brings lush life, but also devastation and death. It awakens intense feelings in people, and its waters are worshipped like a god. It is the wind with the three faces. Orissa on the Bay of Bengal in northeast India. Countless river estuaries interlock the extremely flat coastal areas with the sea. People here live off the water. When the brackish waters along the coast are calm, they catch young shrimp and sell them to breeders. The summer monsoon is their life giver. It brings rain and food for the fish. And sometimes it turns into a cyclone without warning. Babu Mandal and his younger brothers live with their uncle Chitaranjan these days. It was a late monsoon storm that took his parents away from him. Water started rising gradually in the night, and the wind was gathering speed. My father was at sea. I was at home with my mother, uncle and two brothers. It was late summer 1999. The summer monsoon was coming to an end, and the time for storms had arrived. But the cyclone, which had been brewing over the Bay of Bengal, came so fast that even experienced fishermen decided too late to turn back. 20 feet high waves made steering a mere matter of luck. The storm raged through the flat coastal area of Orissa at a speed of 180 miles an hour. A storm which originates at sea generally calms down as soon as it reaches land. But this one raged on for almost two days. Cities located as far as 15 miles from the coast were destroyed. Never before had this force of nature come so far inland. The storm caused terrible damage inland. It tore across 120 miles of the coast, adding a further fatal danger, tidal waves. Water was rising slowly in the night, but on Friday morning, the tidal waves struck the village and we were all swept away and separated. We didn't know where everybody had gone. The tidal wave was very strong. Many people were washed away. My uncle and others were swept away. I saw lots of animals too in the current. Like thousands of others, Babu was in danger of losing the battle against the floods. Just as I thought it was all over, I caught sight of our pet dog, which was swimming just ahead of me. I grabbed her tail and then lifted my two brothers, who were holding onto my arm and ankle, and put them on the back of the dog. The dog fought against the tide and took us upstream, where my mother and uncle were. The dog saved us, but houses had collapsed, and all around there was just water. Flooding and strong winds are normal during the monsoon season, but not even the oldest people in the area had experienced such a storm. The water they live off suddenly became a killer. A huge tidal wave washed away more than 23,000 houses. Another 746,000 were destroyed by the storm. Even the rice farmers inland were affected. 1,733,000 hectares of farmland were lost. Officially, almost 10,000 people fell victim to the storm, and some say it's likely that there were many more. It seems there was hardly a family to be found which hadn't lost somebody. Renukabla Mandal suffered the same fate. My son got washed away. My eldest son got hold of a tree trunk and he survived. But my youngest son didn't. He and my nephew were unfortunately washed away in the current and never returned. The youngest child of his dead son was Renukabla's only remaining hope. Babu's hopes were with his father. 
Father was at sea, and after two days, we got the news that he had been swept away by the tidal wave. My mother was shocked. She stopped eating, and we couldn't know when exactly she died. My youngest brother was still being breastfed. There was a shortage of food and villagers were literally starved to death. We all became destitute and helpless. Babu's mother died after a few days. We couldn't take her to the hospital. My brother hadn't returned from the sea yet. But my younger brother brought food after eight or ten days. We finally got something to eat. Then the relief came from the government. Food packages were airdropped. That's how we survived. The life-saving food lifted the people's spirits. Few had the opportunity to move away, so like Babu and his uncle, they began to rebuild their destroyed villages in the same places. Today, since the catastrophe in the coastal region of Orissa, four out of five huts have been rebuilt in the danger zone. According to local sources, the village got a concrete shelter after the storm. Babu has become more quiet since the catastrophe. He often climbs up and sits alone on one of the few palm trees in his village which were spared by the storm. The tragedy has left its mark also in the heart of Uncle Chitaranjan. They're staying with me now. They have no house to stay in. I'm struggling myself with my family. I don't have a concrete building. The recent storm blew it away. We're very scared of storms now. How do I survive with these kids? Rajasthan in northwestern India. For the last five years, the life giver, the damp summer monsoon, has dried up before reaching Rajasthan. Bula, a vegetable farmer, knows that he cannot get through the drought single-handedly. Oh God, please give us rain so that the villagers are happy. The land he will one day leave to his son is burnt. Five years ago, this dam was filled with water. Two years ago, the level fell to 20 feet, and now it's completely dry. There's no water in it. Growing vegetables has become very difficult. According to people living there, the water used to be readily available right in front of the huts. But today, women and children have to walk for hours in the burning sun to get water. If it doesn't rain, how can we carry on? How will we survive if the crops fail? There'd be no fodder. The cows would die. Thousands of animals are dying of thirst. Empty villages are the signs of the lost battle against the drought. For years, the groundwater level in Rajasthan has been sinking several feet per year. Dowries, the traditional step wells, were once the center of village life. They're built to prevent the precious water from evaporating, but some have already dried up. Millions of people in Rajasthan depend on water delivery. Twelve cities and 128 villages are supplied by means of trains. And to some remote areas, drinking water is delivered only by camel-drawn carts these days. This delivery will be the last for three days, but nobody here seems to lose their patience, although the situation seems to be dramatic, according to old Dowder. We've hardly had any rain in the last few years. Villagers believe the sand oracle will reveal all, 
Will a wish for rain be granted this year? Apparently so. His prognosis is good. Monsoon winds will send rain clouds to the village. The oracle is 75% sure of it. But Dada remains skeptical. <laughs> We really hope that it will rain, but we simply don't know if it will. Scientists also look to sand when deciphering the behavior of the monsoon. Marine scientists from the University of Bremen investigated the climate phenomenon at several research trips aboard the Meteor, collecting sediment samples from the ocean's depths. After every monsoon season, sediment is left behind in layers. The sediments record tiny animals that are indices of the wind strength during the Indian summer monsoon. 60% of the Earth's population lives in monsoon areas, and some scientists believe that by the year 2025, the monsoon is predicted to influence the lives of 75% of the world's population. Time is running out. Even one of the most sophisticated forecasting systems is eventually overruled by the forces of nature. Slimy sediment from the sea floor seems to be part of a puzzle that reveals the complexity of the monsoon system. And understanding this complexity is the first step towards forecasting systems that are able to get the two faces of the monsoon, flooding and drought, under control. To facilitate precise analysis, it's necessary to separate sediment from water very carefully. Once this is done, the sediment takes off on a long journey to research laboratories around the world. The first region to be reached by the monsoon every year is Kerala in the south of India. Ever increasing waves are a sign that the monsoon is on its way and it will, without doubt, show its ugly side to the fishermen of Kerala. During the monsoon season, the beach will be eroded. Higher waves will be coming in shorter periods and for about three months, those waves will take away the beach. The waves are still far enough away from the huts, which are closed today. It is a day of worship. Many of the fishermen in Kerala are practicing Christians. According to the local people, the churches are fuller than usual shortly before the monsoon arrives. The people pray ardently that the monsoon waves will spare their huts this time. Antanama, however, was not lucky. Problems are plentiful for us. Our houses get destroyed by the sea during every monsoon season. It comes so suddenly and just washes away all of our belongings. I even lost my husband to the sea. I didn't even get to see his body. Life is pretty tough for us. Ransanama is afraid that the young people will share the same fate as the older generation, who have experienced the wrath of the monsoon time and time again. Following fishermen's complaints, huge stone walls were built on the beaches. In the beginning, these so-called sea walls brought hope to the fishermen, but the monsoon waves were stronger. Not even the mighty walls stood a chance. What sea walls? The waves are stronger than them. They're so easily demolished by the sea. The walls are of no use to us. And the contractors haven't even completed the construction of the walls. They've only built a portion of them, so they're not even finished. This has become so much a part of our lives. We experience this every year. We don't know when we will be freed of this hardship. The pre-monsoon waves are beginning to close in on the coast. When the monsoon winds begin to blow, the waves will continue to rise. 
Every year, violent breakers tear down the sea walls. Nobody knows whose huts will be swallowed by the monsoon waves this time. The only thing that is sure is that there will be many. Most of the people do not live here by choice. Poverty forces them to move to the coast and to remain here. And as if to mock the fishermen, the same sea which devours the coasts brings the beaches back at the end of the monsoon season. As the waves begin to die down after the monsoon, they push the sand back to the coast. After just a few weeks, the beaches look as if nothing ever happened. At the end of May, monsoon clouds begin to form over the Arabian Sea. Nobody knows whether or not these clouds will reach Rajasthan. The years of drought have left their mark. The lack of water has even caused ancient traditions to wither away. Fathers no longer allow their daughters to marry. They're afraid their daughters will not have a secure existence because of the drought. <laughs> Times of need have produced many singles here. Farmer Yagdish is one of them. I'm 48 years old and I've never been married because we used to waste water. And without water, no man was prepared to give us his daughter. There was just no way out of the misery. Because of the lack of water, we couldn't allow our children to marry. Kajori Devi saw young people growing up thirsting for water and love. A few years ago, Rajendra Singh visited the farmers and encouraged them to practice long-lasting water management. His message was simple and easy to follow, but it required great effort. God gives you water, but it simply flows away without being used. So I advise you to collect the water and store it. Like Kajori Devi, the people picked up on this old idea and began working to conserve water. Their aim is to set a trap for the monsoon when it comes on its rare visits. The idea is to collect as much rainwater as possible. Not a drop should be lost to the desert. Rajendra Singh's message reached the women in particular. While their men were away working outside the village, they left their homes to work with shovels and pickaxes. They restored old cisterns, dug trenches, and freed ponds of sediment. If the community works together to conserve the water, we can not only save the plants, but also remain drought free. In the center of Rajasthan lie the ruins of Bangar, a city surrounded by mystery. Here, the remains of houses and temples from a once blooming city are spread out over seven square miles. It seems Bangar was deserted very suddenly by its 10,000 inhabitants. Rajendra Singh claims to know the reason for the mysterious fate of Bangar. This is Bangar. Up till 500 years ago, it was the capital of a powerful empire. But in the later years, this puzzling city faced a severe shortage of water and was gradually deserted. Over there was the bazaar of this once prosperous city. Jaipur, the capital of Rajasthan, located not far from Bangar, faces a similar fate. Instead of collecting monsoon water, wells were dug deeper and deeper. This method seemed simple and cheap, but in the end it endangered the lives of the people. Jaipur already lacks 90% of the required water. It has to be delivered. Life on the streets and in the marketplaces still takes its regular course. However, the outskirts of the city are already showing evidence of an increasing lack of water. The water 
castle Chalmahal was once used for royal duck hunting. Today, the folk play cricket there. The amber fort in Jaipur. Locals tell tourists about how beautiful the reflection of the fortress in the lakes at the foot of the hill once was. Today, the lakes are completely dried up. I think that India has a lesson to learn. If we don't get together and start conserving water, then the story of Bengal would be repeated. In places where Singh's methods were accepted and practiced, there is enough water, and not only for the people. We've water now even during the drought, and we have good harvests. Our whole world has changed. We've created our own little paradise. Old traditions have also returned to the village. Fathers no longer have any reason to prevent their daughters from marrying. These days, you can see young children being married off again. But I'm still a bachelor. Even though we have enough water now, I'm not going to allow myself to get married off. While the farmers in Rajasthan fight for every drop of water, the fishermen in Kerala will soon have too much of it. Here in this southwestern state of India, powerful breakers begin to roll up against the coast, an unmistakable indication of the imminent monsoon season. The fishermen begin to bring their boats to safety at the pier of Vizinjam Harbour. For days, the boats are brought one by one to the sheltered harbour. Soon, several hundred of them will be harboured in the still waters, and many of them will not leave the pier for weeks. Pankras is one of them. We make a living by going out to sea, and during the monsoon, the sea is rough. So we are unable to go fishing, and are faced with poverty and starvation. Although Kamalus is fully aware of how dangerous the ocean is during the monsoon season, he still goes out to sea. But there are more fish out there during this season, as it's the breeding season. We risk our lives, as the catch is invariably good. Sometimes we make 3,000 to 4,000 rupees on a single day, as compared to 1,000 rupees on an average day. Kamalus wants a more powerful motor for his boat to ensure more safety on his trips during the monsoon. Nobody can keep him from fulfilling his wish. Kamalus doesn't believe that meteorologists understand monsoon weather better than he does. Not at all. Sometimes they announce that it could be dangerous for us to go out to sea. Sometimes we believe them and stay away from work. Almost invariably, there would be no strong winds on that day, and we would only end up losing a day's wages. We know it better than them. He is not the only daring fisherman, others follow suit. It's like this, if you would ask one of us if we will be alive tomorrow, we would not be able to give you a definite answer. Some of us could even be brought back dead. The meteorological station at Trivandrum, India's southernmost weather station on the monsoon front. Meteorologists have been observing the oncoming rain wind for weeks. Station manager M.D. Rachmandran must be informed about the current whereabouts of the monsoon. Calls come in regularly. People are becoming impatient. The mighty rain clouds are already a week late and are still quite a distance from the coast. This year it is entirely different. This year, it's entirely different. There's no rain at all. That's why children are wondering whether or not to carry an umbrella to school. I have to carry an umbrella to school. Like that on the day in Alaska. It's going on like that. A cyclone has driven the oncoming clouds back out to sea. The people are beginning to lose their patience. Okay. 
many of them are already moving out to Kovalam Beach to see the first signs of the great rain themselves. Some take a final dip in the sea before the increasing breakers make it impossible to swim. The people believe help will come from the gods. The Hindus make sacrifices to Indra, the god of rain, and Varuna, the god of the sky. They chant hymns from the holy scriptures to bring rain. And then, the monsoon finally shows its mighty third face. Each year, 140 billion cubic feet of rainwater falls over India, most of it within the three months to come. In the cities, people soon become accustomed to getting wet. Many say they consider it refreshment after the long dry period. A wave of vitality sweeps through the entire country, bringing rich green landscapes. It is a time of abundance and creation. Fields and plantations soak up the water greedily. Trees trap the rain, saving it for after the rainy season. The warm rainwater is almost addictive. Josie, the rice farmer, is confident that he has waited for the right time to sow his seeds. A false estimation can result in the seeds drying out or becoming mouldy. But this year, Josie's family will have enough to eat. Careful observation of nature and knowledge passed on by his father have taught him how to read the signs. Signs which he will soon pass on to his son. <laughs> So far, the rains have favoured the farmer. If this pattern of rain continues, it'll be good. If only it continues like this. Josie secretly calculates the yield he can expect from his fields in a good year. In a year like this, one hectare of land can produce up to 3.5 tonnes of rice. Soon, the seeds will germinate, banishing all worries for a year. A few weeks after sowing, the rice plants are ready for replanting. The seedlings are distributed evenly over the entire field in order to ensure maximum yield. <laughs> The farmer benefits most from the normal optimum rainfall. If it's less than normal, it's bad. If it's much more than normal, we face difficulties too. But still, more rain is better than no rain. A few days after its arrival in Kerala, the monsoon has reached the northeasternmost part of India, Cherrapunji. And this mud bath is just the beginning. Cherrapunji holds the rainfall world record with almost 41 feet of rainwater per year. However, after the monsoon, the people will once again pay seven rupees for a bucket of water. No lasting water management methods are practiced here, in one of the wettest parts of the world. The water in most of India's rivers originated mainly from the monsoon. All rivers are worshipped in India. But the Ganges is the most holy. The goddess Ganja frees the soul of bonds through birth and death. 
To see the Ganja worship her, take a holy bath and drink from her holy waters is the pilgrim's main objective. On certain astrologically determined days, the nectar of immortality is present in the waters of the Ganges. The pilgrims bathe in it, seeking redemption. For practicing Hindus, water possesses immeasurable power, not as a danger, but as a divine manifestation. Every three years, millions of pilgrims attend the feast of Kumbha Mela, believed to be the largest religious feast in the world. These waters are also where scientists look for facts about the monsoon. Their objective is to predict its future by looking at its past, a future which is very important for the people in Southeast Asia. The careful handling of the sediment samples is entering its final phase. Laid out in layers, the valuable material is ready to be sent off to scientific institutes around the world. At the Indian Institute for Technology, paleontologist Anil Gupta prepares a sediment sample he's received from the ocean drilling program. The sample came from a drilling site off the coast of East Africa. The sediments reveal tiny creatures to Gupta, so-called Globigerina buloades. These single-celled foraminifera are the key to the history of monsoon strength. The tiny organisms also tell their master about the future of the monsoon. I treat it as my fossil guru, in fact, uh, because it inspires me. It has given me a lot of uh, idea about the monsoon, and this uh, this species uh, has given me so much of thrill and happiness that I cannot express. It is uh, it is a wonderful experience uh, analyzing this tiny creature. The amount of these sea creatures present in the samples tells Gupta about the strength of the Indian summer monsoon. The more the wind stirs up the Arabian Sea, the more food becomes available to the single-celled organisms. After they die, their shells sink to the bottom of the ocean. The sediment samples reveal that strong winds began to blow about nine million years ago. This was the birth of the monsoon. Over 70 million years ago, the Indian plate began to drift northwards. As a result of the collision with Asia, the Himalayas and the highlands of Tibet were raised. About nine million years ago, the mountain range was so far advanced that ever since then, the sun heats up the Tibetan plateau in the spring. Warm air rises, which draws masses of very damp air in from the Arabian Ocean. This discrepancy between land and water temperature is the motor of the Indian summer monsoon. At the beginning of June, the rain clouds reach India and the monsoon sweeps toward the north of the country. Rainfall is distributed unevenly over the mainland, causing drought and floods alike. After about three months, the summer monsoon comes to an end. In Utah, traces of the oldest known monsoon system can be found today in the red rocks of the Navajo sandstone. Those traces come from rainfall that occurred when all the land masses we know today were joined to the supercontinent Pangaea. When geologist and sand dune specialist David Lupi approaches the Navajo sandstone, his thoughts travel back 190 million years to Pangaea. Back then, Utah was situated at the western margin of the ancient supercontinent. The Navajo sandstone is made by migrating sand dunes. And in a migrating sand dune, the steep side is where the sand is deposited. So in this case, the dune is moving from left to right, younger layers laid down as the wind blows sand from the upwind side of the dune and dumps it. Okay, so all the motion is from left to right. The wider grooves were caused by strong winter winds. Weaker summer winds came from the other direction and blew some of the sand back up the dunes. This is evident from the narrower grooves in the rock. That was the evidence that winds changed direction with the seasons, proof of monsoon winds in the original Utah. 
but was there also evidence of monsoon rains to be found? Lupi found what he was looking for high up in the red dunes. He discovered so-called slumps in the rock, traces of sliding sand, which could only have been caused by rain. Up in here at this level, there are 30 consecutive deposits, each one representing a year. 30 summers, 30 winters. And during the winter, the dominant wind drove the sand to the southeast, and in the summer, the light winds pushed some sand up against that steep leaf face, and then the winter would dominate again. But also during the summer, an important thing happened. We've got these slumps, and here are three in a row. This mass of sand slumped down over this one, and then was buried by the winter deposits. And then this one came down. And you can see the, the folding in this mass after the rain. And then it was eroded and then buried by the next winter. So in this outcrop, we've got the essence of the monsoon. We've got evidence for shifting wind direction and evidence for the arrival of the rain always at the same time in the annual cycle. Another monsoon system exists in North America today, not far from the fossilized traces of the oldest monsoon system in the world. In the southwest of the United States and in Mexico, the highlands heat up so much in the summer that the rising warm air draws masses of damp air in from the ocean. The desert city of Las Vegas lies at the edge of this North American monsoon system. With a mere 3.5 inches of rain per year, everyone in Las Vegas would welcome a bit of rain. In July 1999, the sun beat down on the trailers in the Miracle Mile mobile home park. Nothing could entice the residents away from their air-conditioned rooms, least of all the weather. On the 8th of July, nobody realized what was brewing in the heat of the night. Meteorologists from the National Weather Service had been following the weather situation on their screens. Chief of the station, Kim Runk, took the situation very seriously. So at 9.36 a.m., the Las Vegas Weather Office issued its first flash flood warning for the Las Vegas Valley. In the trailer park, Frank Massaro and Marilyn Fraser had been hoping it would cool down a bit. When we got the warning that morning, eh, flash flood, you know. Overlook it. We've had about two or three here, but nothing like this sand all over the place and all that. So I was kind of enjoying it for a while. Filmmaker Durango Lane was just about as interested in the weather situation as he usually was. That means not at all. Then he got a rude awakening. It came through here like a, like a big tornado, like a big bomb. The Flamingo Wash had flooded its banks and was shooting across the main street. The river, which was more like a rivulet most of the time, had suddenly transformed into a roaring monster and was raging through the trailer park. Frank Massaro and Marilyn Fraser had fled their home when they realized the floods were rising under their trailer. When the rain stopped, Frank wanted to go back. I fell over halfway in, and then the other half wasn't in, and there was thoughts that maybe when it all stopped I could get some of my stuff out, but there was no way I could do that. But there was worse to come. The flash flood had washed away too much earth from under the trailers. Those three trailers right there just went ahead and blip, blip, blip. The bushes on the riverbank could not withstand the force of the flood, and several trailers were simply washed away. I saw the shed go by just as he was supposed to be going into it, and that is when my blood really ran cold because it, it dawned on me that instant how fast things like that can happen. He could be gone. The flood channels in the desert city were not able to cope with more than half of the yearly ration of rain at one time. Damage to buildings amounted to at least $20 million.
half of my audio and video equipment and both of my vehicles were destroyed. Uh, about $45,000 worth, you know, besides the mobile home. The material things can be replaced. It takes a long time though, <laughs> but uh, you can't replace each other. The day after the flash flood, the extent of the damage to the trailer park became evident. President Clinton declared Clark County in Las Vegas a disaster area. But the real long-term damage lies deep in the minds of the victims. It actually still isn't over, no, but it, it took more than days for us to put together what really happened. I mean, all of our, I at one point felt like my whole life is down that wash. You know, all my years of photographs and just things that you don't really, you take for granted. Those things, when you lose them, they can't be replaced. Since 1988, $840 million have been spent on effective flood protection. The district, however, plans to spend another $1.7 billion in another 62 detention basins and 476 miles of channels. A good investment, according to Kim Runk. The climatology suggests that heavy rainfall is very rare, uh, but in our valley we have experienced and measured rainfall that exceeds the all-time record for McCarran at least five times in the last five years. So the existence of rainfall, significant rain events in the desert, is actually much more frequent than the climatology would suggest. Las Vegas is surrounded by high mountains. The city is located virtually at the bottom of a huge bowl. 62 gigantic reservoirs have been built in order to prevent future rainfall flowing down from the mountains into the settlements. But not every region is so well protected, and around 8,000 new inhabitants per month need space. And many of them have to learn to distinguish safe building sites and flood risk zones. There's a golf course that's going in and there's a large area of land that is being developed. Within a year that will be uh, several hundred new homes with new residents and they're right at the foot of this steep gradient of terrain in the mountains so they're going to be immediately downstream of runoff from heavy rainfall in the future. Meteorologists are trained to forecast weather conditions, and Kim Runk was right. On the 19th of August, 2003, another monsoon storm struck Las Vegas, and once again the bottom of the bowl filled up with water. In the midst of it all, a fire engine which had been on its way to one of the many disaster areas. One thing is for sure, it was not the big flood, and was certainly not the last one to leave its mark in the desert city. more than half of the world's population lives in monsoon areas. The largest connected monsoon system stretches from Africa to Pakistan and Nepal to East Asia. The summer monsoon strikes somewhere in this zone practically on a yearly basis. And these are some of the world's fastest growing regions. A key question is, will monsoon floods and storms increase and threaten the lives of billions of people? However, the monsoon also gives life. Without it, billions would be without food. The people in large cities accept the surplus of water which comes with the summer. They know that they could die without the monsoon. Another key question, will the amount of rain during the monsoon season change? Scientists believe they've found the answer in the cold region of the North Atlantic. As Anil Gupta learned from his little organisms, there was tremendous variability of the monsoon over the last 30 to 40,000 years. He decided to look at the climate parameters of other regions. What he found was really astonishing. He found that the changes that have happened in the North Atlantic, they are well aligned with the changes which we are seeing in the 
southwest monsoon. And the correlation still exists. Gupta can read the warming of the Earth's atmosphere over the last 400 years in the sediment samples. If global warming continues, the Asian summer monsoon will increase in intensity. Floods and earth erosion would be the result, and this is very probable. Greenhouse gases, they are heating the atmosphere. So you have more heating, more temperature rise. We, we believe that monsoon will intensify. In Rajasthan, the dry face of the monsoon vanished this year. In many places, it had already rained 220 milliliters by the end of July, a 16% increase that could be harvested in many regions. A sign of the intensifying of the monsoon? The women have left the dusty waterholes and exchanged their digging tools for kitchen appliances. But if the monsoon intensifies, it will reveal more often its wet face. And that means better harvest for millions of people, but also more floods and storms.